This is the story of four families with one goal, to work and prosper on their own piece of land. Once this was sheep country, hacked from the Whanganui bush by First World War veterans. But their dream lasted only a generation. Their labor built only a bridge to nowhere. Beneath these trees lie stories of men and women who tried and finally failed to make a piece of this land their own. Like Scotswoman Jenny McNabb. I think her pioneering spirit, her strength, her absolute courage to come out from Glasgow on a ship and then to go up the river in the bush on a pack horse and to go across those swing bridges. I mean, I, I think I'd probably say, take me home. But in those days, they never showed emotion or anything like that, perhaps, and they just accepted that that was their lot and they got on with it. And as for the, you know, their isolation, I really like people, and I think my grandmother did too. So to be there with only her sister, it must have been a, a tremendous um, cultural shock. Jenny and Nancy McNabb came from Glasgow to nowhere, far up the Whanganui River. Their daughters, May and Margaret, grew up here, and now they return with Jenny's granddaughters, Glenda and Jenny, to explore the story of their pioneer ancestors. That started in a London hospital in 1915. West Coast engineer Fred Betjeman was wounded at Gallipoli and met Nancy McNabb while he was convalescing. My mother, who was a fully trained nurse at that stage, she was one of the nurses there. And uh, my father was a very handsome man and she had the most gorgeous auburn hair. Anyway, they fell in love. And when dad was well enough, they got married and because mother came from Glasgow, he had to go and meet her parents. So they decided to have a short honeymoon on Loch Lomond. Dad was then sent back to the front, which was then the trenches in France. And while he was there, I was born, but he never ever saw me because he got um, typhoid fever. So he was sent directly home to New Zealand. After the horrors of the Western Front trenches, Fred Betjeman dreamed of peace and independence on his own farm. He was balloted a block of land in the Mangapurua Valley under the government's soldier settlement scheme. In 1918, he and his brother Harry went up the Whanganui and began the backbreaking job of making farming sense of the virgin bush. Felling, burning, track cutting, pit sawing timber for their first crude homes. A year later, Fred sent to Scotland for Nancy and the two-year-old daughter he had never seen. When they arrived in the Mangapurua, they were the only females in the valley. The boat pulled in against the landing, which was a sloping papa clay landing. But as she came in to see where she was going, there wasn't a building in sight, nor even clear land. It was bush, bush and more bush and there was a plank put from the deck of the boat across to the landing. And my mother had to cross that at the landing. There were no women at all, of course, just men in, in singlets and bowings. Yes. And yes. My mother, who had never been on a horse in her life, had to get on a horse and Dad walked and led it. And we set off along this very winding path. His farm was eight miles from the landing and that six foot track wound round hills, alongside streams, around bluffs which were just so high. So that if you can picture my uncle on his horse at the front with me, then the pack team, and then my mother on the horse, but Dad leading it. And of course, there was no room for horses to play up, and one fell over the cliff. And my mother, she thought it was Uncle Harry with me on the front. So of course, she was in terrible state till Dad yelled out. He probably knew that it wasn't, but he called out and Harry said, no, it's a pack horse gone over. However, they carried on and got home. 
and they went inside and boiled up the billy um, to have a cup of tea. She said, thank the dear Lord we're home. And Dad always says that were the most wonderful words he ever heard because he was quite sure she would be saying, get me back to Glasgow as fast as you can. Two years later, Nancy's younger sister Jenny made the same journey upriver. During the war, she had been manpowered as a secretary and become engaged to an Aussie soldier on leave. He was killed on the very last day of the war. So that she might cope with her grief, her parents sent Jenny off to join her sister on the other side of the world. Aunt Nance was coping, but um, was uh, going to have a second baby, and uh, their mother and father thought, well, perhaps it would help both sisters to have each other, mother in her time of grief, and auntie in her time of new beginnings and despair, probably, at times. I think my mother would be much more prepared than Aunt Nance for what was ahead. But you can be prepared, but still cannot believe what you're going into. Among the 40 Mangapurua settlers was Herb Bolton, the big man who had cleared the block down the road from Fred and Nance. Jenny made a match with Herb, so now the sisters could stay close and the children could be playmates. Then there was a path down from the wash house. And so are we in the house now? You should be on a Help. piece of concrete. We, we must be on the edge of the concrete now. Concrete? Yeah, that was well they put down. And it used to float when it rained. <laughs> Dad had built the furniture. Mother's job then, of course, was to do all the sock furnishing. First of all, it would be flower bags, um, with full of sheep's wool to make the padding. Then she would cover that with dyed sugar bag and, um, and then embroider, perhaps a little motive on it or something. And that was our sitting room furniture. The curtains were made from flower bag and she decorated those with embroidery along the bottom. All this took quite a long time, of course, and she still had me to keep an eye on. So every time yes. Grandad did shearing, he had to bring them all around the side of the yes. bus Must to here. And because his farm was over there, so yeah. he had to take them across that swing bridge. Yes. I remember there was an English farmer up the road, and one of his little money-making things was to meet the boat and bring the mail up on the split sack. And we always used to hear him say, mail all, and that was very exciting for my mother because of course there would be letters from Scotland. I remember one day the mail came and there was a letter edged in black and I knew that meant bad news and yes, granddad had died. And mother went away for a while to her bedroom and no doubt had a weep about it. But, um, then she got on with life. There was no rushing over to the funeral or anything like that. We are actually sitting in the edge of the pen, a big pen that was really a veggie garden that wasn't used a lot for veggies in the end because my pet lambs were always in it. Pet lambs were my, my plaything. Sophie, and uh, I just adored them. And probably one's buried over about there. In the first years after burning, the grass grew well and the wool clip increased. But the post-war wool boom didn't last. Prices fluctuated, and by the end of the 1920s had reached an all-time low. The small community worked hard, shared knowledge and made the settlement work. Isolation drew families together. They made their own fun, with communal picnics and dances. By 1927, there were enough children to start a school and their mothers rode miles to regular meetings of the Country Women's Institute. But there was to be no enduring place for the Mangapurua settlers. This land was not made for sheep, only for the bush and the rain. Sheep were better matched for the Elworthy's piece of land on the South Canterbury Downs. 